Okay, ladies and gentlemen, while they all get themselves comfortable, this is our panel session on future challenges in cyber security. So as you can see, we have three panel members to share their opinions with us and also to take your questions. Um, and so, in order from this side across, we have Dr. Paul Dowland, who is an academic here at Plymouth University. He's our subject group leader for the area of security and networks. Um, and he delivers modules himself on the areas of network security and application security, and that's his background. We have, um, you've already met her today, Amanda Finch, the General Manager of the Institute of Information Security Professionals, um, a former board member and program director of the Institute. She specialised in information security management since 1991 and was awarded in 2007 European Chief Information Security Officer of the Year by Secure Computing Magazine. And finally, we have John Finch, um, ICT Service Manager at Plymouth City Council, um, plus also Chair of the Southwest Wall. Um, he also, just to give further background on John, completed his MSc in Information Systems Security here at Plymouth University about a decade ago, wasn't it, John, if I remember? Twelve years. Twelve years ago, and he said that with such enthusiasm as well. <laughs> okay, so welcome to the panel, and I've got just a few preset questions that I can offer into the mix to get things going. Now what I'm going to do with the first question is ask it and ask each of the panel members to give their view on it and then to be honest if there are questions that already by that point you'd like to start offering from the audience please feel free to do so and I'll look out for hands accordingly otherwise I'll carry on with questions that I've got here and we'll proceed on that basis. So the first question panel members uh, what do you see as the key cyber security challenges for the next three to five years? And let's start, well Paul's looking at me sort of eagerly, so let's start with <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent work, yeah. Hello everyone. I'm at a slight disadvantage in that I've been running backwards and forwards during today's session, so I've not been able to catch up with the, uh, the speakers that we've had so far today. A few little snippets at the beginnings and ends, so I apologise if I say anything that has been repeated many times by our previous speakers. Uh, I've also just been running setting this up as well, so I'm a bit out of breath. Um, for me, one of the uh, for two of the, the major issues that we're, we're likely to see over the next few years, and this is coming out of some of the, the intelligence reports from various vendors, um, as well as my own experience, both in the university and also externally, um, is the, the increased um, sort of outsourcing of IT and IT functions and systems in general. So in particular, the sort of people bring your own device, and you know, I'm sporting here a lovely iPhone, I'm sure that Steve has probably got multiple Apple devices beside him, uh, many of which are not corporate property, um, although perhaps they are and he doesn't sort of see it quite that way. <laughs> He's got many of them there. And of course, you're, you're all fully aware of all the problems with bring your own device. And as we're approaching the Christmas season, it's very likely that many of us will be receiving some kind of tech toy gadgetry um, in our Christmas stockings or under the tree. Um, and of course, at some point, they're all going to end up in the organisational enterprise environment. So we can't stop that thing from happening, that progress. People are increasingly expecting to use their personal devices within the organisational context. And whilst we may still have rules and regulations and policies about how they are used, over time you're going to end up with more and more of those devices. And there are indeed many organisations now that don't even have corporate devices. They actually have a completely open policy and it's not the norm. Um, it may well increasingly become so in future years. So obviously we've got an issue with the, the devices that the users are using, um, but then we're going at the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of the, the servers and the infrastructure and the storage. And obviously increasingly that's being moved out into the cloud, and we've got all the, the both legal issues and also the sort of government, governance issues, and just the uncertainty about how in the long term we're going to be looking after those kind of systems, the infrastructure, the data protection, and all the other things that go along with that. Um, and in fact, there was a recent stat showing that over the next 12 months, servers being sold in worldwide are not going to be going into organisations on the whole. They're going to be increasingly going into these big data centres as part of the cloud or virtualisation presence that's available all around the world. That's probably enough from me. Cool. <coughs> oh. Amanda? Right. Well, I think I agree pretty much with everything that Paul said. I think that um, it's definitely going to be the um, a lot happening with um, personal devices and the blurring between um, home and, um, and, and business. I think the other thing that we're going to see is the problem with SMEs as well, is that SMEs have traditionally not been involved in the chain of looking at information security, that um, corporates have always 
done a reasonable job at looking at security, whereas smaller organisations haven't had as much focus on that. But if you look at the amount of um, stuff that we outsource to third party suppliers, I think securing the supply chain is going to be a real issue and we're going to see some real scare stories where people that are sort of downsourced, downsourced, downsourced have caused a problem that has really, really hit a big organisation. So I think that's one that you're going to get in the headlines as well. Um, one of the other organisations outside of the um, IISP that I work for is the Information Security um, Forum and they look at um, threat horizons in a PLEST model which is political, legal, economic, social and technology. And I think that we'll get some things that we didn't expect because that model you can't really control in many ways. So it depends on what happens politically, that there's an awful lot going on in the world at the moment. That could destabilise some of the ways that we look at security. Legal, um, I think we're going to see more regulation. I think we're going to see growth in globalisation of legislation and boundaries and dealing with things in different jurisdictions and how we cope with that. Um, that, I think, will come with it, and I would say this anyway. I think that there'll be this sort of almost passport to work type thing happening with security people because people will be accountable or, or organisations will want to have somebody that's accountable um, that they can come back to for that. Um, economic, um, well, who knows where the economy is going? And again, it's the global side of that that, that I think is interesting. China's sort of going into a recession. They're still growing at a reasonable percent, but that's changing. For them, they're sort of going into a recession. Um, how's that going to affect everybody, and how's that going to affect how people are doing things like industrial espionage, um, because knowledge is king, and um, therefore the malware and the, the information gathering from that side. Social, we've seen Snowden, we've seen prison, we've seen um, people's attitudes to privacy changing. Um, I think there's almost an age test with that at the moment, but people that think that Snowden is a hero are probably under 30. People that think he's a villain are probably over 50. So I think that leaves a good, the rest of you a good chunk of where you want to be. Um, and I think there's, there's, act, act, there's attitudes with that. I think there's also the whole thing with social media and Facebook will probably be dying by that stage with any luck. And technology, um, but it will be replaced with something a lot worse, don't worry. Um, and technology, um, it will move faster and faster. And I, my prediction is that you'll have people attacking things like pacemakers and, and home systems, and they'll have the curtains going back and forwards and weird things like that. But we probably won't know, we'll probably be wrong. Thank you. And John? Um, as, as much really that Paul's the issue of mobility and um, where is our data. <clears throat> but I think that one of the biggest challenges we're going to face is um, authentication of identity and the verification of who people are. Because people have got so many different personas now. You've got your social networking, your business persona, and so many different devices. It's how do we get the challenge of making that completely seamless and um, ensuring that it's accurate. And um, people are, are want to be able to move around society using that same identity, for example, if you walk through the city centre now, you'll um, jump onto so many different wireless hotspots. You don't want to log into each different one, but somebody's going to come up with a way of um, having a centralised authentication so that you can just walk seamlessly through society, getting the effectivity you want. That's it, really. Okay, thank you. Audience members, any thoughts or questions at this point? Anything that you think the panel missed, which you think that was suitably thorough? In their responses. Yes. What's the likely shift in the security world to address the general social trend towards data being consumed as air rather than just being a technical feature that we've got now? So you sort of noticing on the way that they're treating mobile phone adverts, it's all about consumption of data and the language is all going down the route of data being treated as air, water, almost as an essential element of life. How does that affect us as security professionals where some of us might have moved in the past from a security says no to a security says yes but probably means no to an actual oh, I'm not going to survive unless I say yes in an innovative way. So it's a shift from the word 
Uh, it's a shift from the perception of challenge to opportunity in this world of where data is consumed rather than just a feature. And also an expectation of yes. more and more people. Yeah. Absolutely. John? Um, just picking up on that, I mean, it, it, it's essentially mobile devices, and then the big key word there is consumed, and this is data that people are not creating. They're actually just, it's they're watching videos, and um, it's the con the consuming data. So there's less of an issue there for cybersecurity, because you're, um, you're not actually creating anything. I think the perception is that people need to think differently about where their data is, and I think that's the big challenge that we um, potentially face is, we don't actually know where all our data is and what, where everything is that's stored about you. For example, yeah. you put something onto a cloud-based service, it could be anywhere in the world. And I think people need to know where that is and at the moment there isn't that transparency. Do you think people care where their data is? No, they should No, I, I don't think people do. And I don't know what will happen to make people want to care. <coughs> but, but, but something will have to happen that will make people suddenly be very, very concerned about where their data is held. And at the moment, I think it's the, the, it's obscurity because there's so much out there. I think it's quite obvious what will cause it to happen, which is that at some point there's going to be some fairly high profile legal cases. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, we're, we're safely hidden away from this by that in most cases it's organisations that are impacted and it tends to be internal, and it might get picked up as part of an audit, for example, um, or as part of the commissioning process. But I think over the next few years, as it becomes more common to store all of your data in the cloud, and people start to move their content around to cloud providers, so at the moment it might be new to an organisation, you might have a well-established contract with one provider, but in three years' time there might be some new deal that comes along, some new provider that offers a, a better package, you start to move your data around, do you bring all of those same controls and constraints you had originally with you? And of course, are all providers going to be operating ethically um, and telling you the truth about where your data is? Um, and I guess there's also another question, which is that if you are with a provider and that provider has a major service outage, would you rather your data was still accessible, but in a country that doesn't meet with your policies, um, or would you rather have downtime? And I think in most large organisations, that would be a difficult, but probably an obvious decision. Um, you know, you've got to keep trading, um, but if that means that your data is now outside of whatever jurisdiction you need it to be in, there could be a whole bunch of legal and ethical issues that follow on from that, which seemed like a perfectly logical, rational decision at the time, um, but if that provider only has one data centre, say, in the UK or in Europe, and you end up in America, and then there's going to be some interesting legal challenges in the next few years. And I think also it's how they're dealt with as well, because um, there may be the, the argument about whether they'd rather take the legal challenge and retain the market share or whatever with that. And I think the other thing with that is that with people going into the cloud, I think what we might even see is people not being able to get to their data because either um, an organisation has tried to change cloud supplier and they haven't read the small print properly and found that actually they've given their data to that supplier and all they've got is a bit of code that's not going to enable them to be able to recreate it again. Um, or if, if, if um, a cloud supply goes bust, and uh, where, where's that going to take them, basically? I mean, there was a good example of that earlier this year when 2E2 went bust, and um, there was a hospital trust had all their data stored with 2E2. Um, 2E2 went bust, the hospital lost access to that data, and the um, administrators that came in to take over 2E2 were charging them £20,000 a day to access that data. So there was a, a massive financial impact there, which they probably didn't even consider when they signed the contract. And there'll probably be people that will actually come in and make a very good living out of doing just that mm -hmm. to other organisations. You said that people don't care where the data is, that's because people don't know. Yeah. And fallen technology that people like us to put in. Um, as the first speaker said, social engineering undermines it all. And that was surely seems to be the biggest threat. It's still the individual who isn't being well educated about what they should care about. I, I agree, but I, I would also counter that um, I don't know, five years ago, if you heard something about information security on the radio on prime time, it was a rarity. Um, 
I, I would say virtually every <coughs> week, in fact every week, we're being woken up with Radio 4 with another cyber security story. And I think that user awareness is probably better than it's ever been, but it's still not enough. And there's so much more data going out there that it's a bigger issue. And yeah, we can never do enough on making people understand and be aware of, of, of what it is that they need to protect and try and turn them into risk managers themselves about their own data. I don't think we're doing much at all, really. Mm -hmm. And certainly you know, within organisations, there's a lot of training going on, but there's a public information. You know, a lot of people that, that don't think about it. In schools, they're not taught about it. But there is an increase in awareness, and this came up in um, a session we had last week at the university with the um, talk on cryptography, where um, every time there's now a public data loss of a laptop or something like that, it's made in headlines whether it was encrypted or not. But there's still the public perception of oh, lack of understanding about what that actually means. So you still have people with encrypted laptops that store the password on the laptop, um, negating it, and they don't actually understand the fundamentals. And just going back to what the, the first questioner asked, or made the comment about the expectation of data access, the mm. data being treated like air, do you think there is a, a general expectation that that is going hand in hand with somebody dealing with the security? Um, there's an increased awareness, Amanda mentioned, of the fact that there are threats. We hear more news stories about security, but do people realise it's something that they need to take on, or do, do they assume that that is dealt with by their provider? <coughs> I think they do assume there is a big assumption that it's being somebody else is looking after it for them. And to what extent do you think that assumption is valid? <laughs> it would mean to, to what extent? Well, do you, th do you think organisations in general that are providing services, user-facing services, mm -hmm. internet providers of, of whatever form, are taking their responsibilities suitably seriously? Can they be relied upon as custodians of the personal data, for example? Some are. Um, for example, the Googles of the world. Um, providing encrypted access and, as we stated earlier, encrypted data. But there are also a lot of um, sort of snake oil salesmen out there where they're basically selling services on the cheap. And people trust what they see on the internet. Yes. Yeah, as an auditor, I've seen very little or very few papers or discussion around who's going to be auditing the cloud and how is it audited. And can you? Because a lot of the, the um, cloud providers, if you look at their small print, it's, it, you can't really audit that easily. And, do, and should we then sort of accept that we can't audit the cloud? And that throws up a whole other host of questions. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, once you, you move into the cloud environment, unless you've got the, the, the cloud to be able to stipulate to the letter what your terms and conditions are, in most cases, you are buying a, a service that's been basically pre-set up, not optimised for any individual to meet any particular auditing requirements, probably to be sold worldwide, and so therefore not going to be optimised for a legal framework. Um, most, I would imagine most corporates wouldn't be in a position to negotiate an appropriate level of audit capability into the contracts for their cloud provision. Going on from that again, how will this, or has the ICL made any comments about how he's going to police this but wants to head over? Um, I, I can't really answer that one. Um, I've not seen anything, I don't know what about you. No, not seen anything. Not to see, and you've got to bear in mind, this is a relatively, although we know as professionals that cloud-based services or virtualization services or you know, buying in services is not an unusual new thing, but it's now reaching mainstream and mm. people are now talking about the cloud helped by organisations like Apple, you know, putting the word cloud into their products. It's now seen as a service, um, but yeah, no one's looking at the small print. Question, Question. Question. Well, On a related subject, you said it's very difficult to audit cloud services. What do you think of the um, emerging sort of cloud certification standards and cloud certification bodies, as it were? I've seen the, the CSA doing something along those lines. Um, do you have any thoughts on those? I'm not aware of them, I'm afraid. Um, John? I've, I've, I've heard talk of um, <coughs> authentication and it, it's all very new mm -hmm. at the end of the day. It's, um, there's no definitive standard worldwide that to cover all of these services. 
but if that's the problems we're going to face, it's going to take a long time. I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think that there are organisations that are trying to put in some good ground rules, but I think the problems that we're going to face with that is the whole globalisation side of it, because there will be people that want to do the right thing, and they will do it in jurisdictions that are probably good places to do it. And then you've got the wild, wild west, where, or the wild, wild east, or the wild, wild south, wherever it is, where people will not fall, uh, follow the rules. So it is, it's, 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 it's a sort of, um, I don't know, I suppose maybe kite marking or something like that would be good at some stage, but um, it certainly won't be sort of, I suppose one of the things you need to think about there is that whilst an organisation offering cloud services may wish to look at one of these options, is there going to be a business case to do so? So the chances are that your client base is worldwide, your client base will want a whole variety of different standards, because uh, there's not likely to be one globally adopted one. Is a provider really going to certify in all of them, just a subset, or are they going to focus their activities in one particular location, one jurisdiction? I think it's going to be quite hard to find anything that's not going to be either US-centric or European-centric, um, and you're going to end up with a, a halfway house in all of them. So the things that the CSA is doing and putting out there, for example, it will be unlikely, I guess, to find one of the large cloud service providers being unaware that there was something being put forward in that space, but whether their client base is particularly interested in it, particularly aware of it, and particularly if you think about smaller players, whether they are getting that drive to do so. I think that's a fair point. Now, an analogy there, I suppose, could be drawn with what we've seen over many years now with the International Code of Practice for Security Management. It's been there as a British standard since the mid-90s, it's been there as an international standard since the beginning of the 2000s, and yet there are still many, many organisations that aren't aware of it, and you know, far fewer that are actually compliant with it. And so having the guidance there is one thing, actually getting the traction for people to follow it is another. So there was a hand somewhere, yes sir. Yeah, sorry, we're, we're looking at ways, of, but we were talking about ways of controlling and making sure What's the actual threat, though? What, what are we protecting ourselves against? <coughs> what, what do you three, from the panel, think is the actual threat to us? I mean, from my perspective, it's no different from running your own server infrastructure. Yeah. You know, the, the threats aren't changing. The, the difference is that it's not your infrastructure, and it's that unknown. For me, so if I was to look at outsourcing the, the servers that I manage, for example, um, yes, I'd have no concern that the server is probably in a very secure facility, probably more secure than I could offer. Um, but I would be uncertain about all the other infrastructure that sits around it, about the, the people who would therefore be working on it. I'd have to take it on trust that they are reliable, dependable. And of course, I'm sharing infrastructure. So rather than it being entirely under my control and my jurisdiction, I'm now dealing with a whole raft of other customers and users and administrators who I just don't know. Yeah, can I just elaborate on my, my, what's the threat? What's the threat to the individual? So, yes, you don't know how they're managing the data, but what's the threat to me as an individual that my data is now outside your control? I think to a certain extent, yes. Um, the data is, is now under someone else's jurisdiction <coughs> and my, my slight concern there would be that our legal jurisdiction is quite well defined and we know under what conditions certain agencies can have access to certain bits of data. I would be less confident under other jurisdictions. Now, if I was to move to the cloud, I would probably make sure I'm using a service provider that gives a cast iron guarantee that my data is held in the UK or an appropriate jurisdiction. But as I mentioned earlier, in that disaster situation, do I want that data to move? or do I want that data to be unavailable? And it would, in my case, it would be fine, but there'll be many organisations that couldn't take that risk. That data then ends up in a different jurisdiction with different legal frameworks and you know, different requirements to gain access to it. Suddenly your data, which you previously had very strict controls on, may be accessible to a wider audience. Um, and it's hard to say, really. I was going to say also, with the cloud, that a lot of the T's and C's you signed up, sign up to online and you don't get a paper copy of them so you can find that you've signed up to one set of t's, t's and c's and they've changed completely 
six months down the line. And then the, the other sort of thing that you can have is it depends on what your data is. Um, so you could find that if it's a commercial data, that you're on the same server as one of your competitors and um, they may suddenly see your, your information. It's, but then on the other hand, I think you have to balance this with the fact that cloud gives a lot of organisations um, capability to do things that they would never have been able to do five years ago. So, you know, let's keep, keep it real. And you are also getting the expertise of the yeah. cloud provider. So if you're exactly. a relatively small organisation who doesn't have, you know, the, the world's best security experts on staff, moving to a cloud platform where, in theory, they have the budget to be able to afford much higher levels of, of senior technicians, um, experts in the area, and take the appropriate advice and install the appropriate resources. You know, you are effectively upscaling your security quite considerably. And then fundamentally, the threat is that somebody unauthorizes accessing the data, they're changing it, which can have a, a quite detrimental effect if it's medical data, for example, and you don't know where it's being shared. So you, you could find it's being shared with um, marketing people or <coughs> any other third party. So that's the actual fundamental threats to your data by putting on the, say, cloud services, as opposed to having it on an organisation's network that you've got a contract with. So the, the risk to me is that mm. I am deconstructed and reconstructed by somebody else and, and, and I lose my, as a, as a person, I lose my identity or as a business, I lose my commercial um, control over my commercial secrets. And that's the risk that we're trying to defend against. And we were talking earlier about how do we engage the public. And if, if that's the concern, then how are we engaging the public in understanding that threat to us? Um, I think the most important word that you keep you, 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 you mentioned there two or three times is um, the word risk, and I think that that's the thing people have got to understand. Whether it's your own information or the business's organisation, is what is the risk? What is the doing the impact analysis? You know, when something goes wrong, and um, it's within our community, we know that. And we just need to make sure that we communicate risk and make sure people understand risk. But I think there's a huge piece that needs to be done in a sensible way with end users. I mean, you've got people like Get Safe Online, who've tried to do a lot, and they've done some excellent work there. But you can't tell people enough, but you've got to keep people t telling people in a way that hits home rather than being a sort of, you know, person who just needs to do that. And it's just engagement on the right level, at the right time, in the right way with, with people. And as Paul alluded to in his answer to the first one, you probably need a major incident where there's a severe data loss to get it home to the public. I think you've got to make it real to them, haven't you? Yes. I mean, yeah. we've all it for them. I mean, we send out loads of stuff across Community Council uh, about keeping our information secure, but unless you say actually it's your bank details that are on our servers, you know, and making it real to them, it's information about them. Uh, I think that's the important thing. Yeah. And, and if they, I mean, it sounds awful, but a good incident always makes things come home. So if somebody in the same department has been compromised, um, that sort of obviously gets the game for, for everybody else. And then question up the back. This has probably been alluded to a couple of times already, but we're very used in the financial world to the idea of credit reference agencies who will, with its blessings, tell you whether you're worth something or not. Um, with all the data going into the cloud now, are we going to need some sort of identity reference agency so that if you've got some data with one cloud and some data with another cloud, somebody can make sure that you're the same person if you're trying to unite the data? Um, at a more personal level, um, I'm sure we all know of somebody who's somehow offended Google and therefore found themselves completely cut off from all their live data, photos, etc. because Google have revoked their account. Um, that's the problem is going to grow, surely. And how is it going to be handled in terms of identity and uh, giving stuff back? Uh, 
and that's the, the, the exact thing I was just referring to in the answer to Steve's first question is that identity and authentication <coughs> and identity is one of the biggest challenges we face. And I do, you, do you see how we're going to address it? I, I don't know at the moment. Unless there's a government agency that t uh, sort of um, stands up and decides they're going to give every sort of citizen uh, an identity that um, gets verified. But even at the moment, if you use the government gateway, you've got several different um, logons to that, potentially, so even they haven't um, joined up yet. But that will only work nationally. There has to be an international um, standard, and get an agreement between 202 countries in the UN is uh, going to be a major achievement. Because wasn't it about three or four years ago um, that, that Obama in the States was going to try and give everybody a digital identity? And that all went very, very quiet. I think we had a, 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 a czar, Howard Schmidt, who was going to do all of this stuff. Um, I, I, it's, I think it's very difficult to sort of get like an identity for people like that. One thing I think, I, I love eBay um, for a whole shed load of reasons, but one thing I love about eBay is that they have this sort of self-regulating thing of... Um, whether somebody is a good trader or somebody is a good purchaser, and you, you win points. And I'm wondering whether there's some sort of things like that that needs to go into the cloud environment so that, you know, likes, <laughs> you know, for, 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 for um, how they're managing data. I, I don't, I think that different ways of managing things have got to evolve, um, but I don't think it can be a centric thing because whatever is centric will get. Broken. And, and sort of moving on, so if, if, if you did have a central identity and just have one identity, what happens when you lose it? And then that's a, quite a very scary thought. Or if it gets stolen by someone else. So there's a lot of sort of theoretical and academic arguments and discussions that we have before we can actually think about what an optimum solution would be. Okay, I've got another question I'd like to pose to the panel now. How should we approach the security requirements of new technologies and services? And what can we learn, basically, from past experience? So the cloud, okay, we've talked about that already as one sort of general scenario, but thinking about particular technologies, okay, bring your own devices, one thing that was already mentioned. How can we, how can we cope and how can we learn? It's very difficult, um, is the simple answer. I mean, we've had numerous new technologies, new services, new things come along over the last few years. And it always seemed like we never seem to learn the lessons. Um, there, there's some new product comes along, gets adopted, gets hacked, gets compromised. Um, I think to a certain extent that we can't do anything about it. Um, whatever new service comes along, there's always going to be someone out there to look at a way of compromising it or misusing it. The very nature of, of what we do is that we're trying to stay one step ahead of the attacker. Um, and it, all we can realistically try and do is, is follow good development practice, as we heard from Microsoft earlier, um, good testing, good audit control, as we heard earlier, and good user education. And by, in theory, by combining all of those things, we can mitigate many of the risks, um, but we also have to accept that there's always going to be somebody out there who, if the, uh, the gain is sufficient, will invest sufficient resource, potentially even zero, as we heard earlier, I think it was Chris Bursky was saying that. Um, you know, potentially investing no effort whatsoever in compromising whatever it is that we adopt as the new technology. We are never going to be in a position where we come up with the perfect solution or the, uh, the uncrackable system. There's always going to be somebody motivated enough out there to break it. And we have to accept that that is the case, in my opinion. Um, and when we do accept that, we can then spend more effort and concentrate our, uh, our activities on mitigating when those problems happen and uh, dealing with them as quickly as we possibly can. I think the, 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 the point you hit on with um, um, building security in is really important. And that's the one thing that has never happened, has it? But it's always been the sort of bleeding edge technology. It's always been about functionality. And then the security side sort of plays catch up afterwards. Now, I don't know whether there's ever going to be a time where people actually sort of develop the security and the functionality at the same time. Um, because that's the only way it's ever going to happen. Otherwise, the people are just going to go for functionality because it's a new toy, and then we're just going to have to go through the catch-up again. 
maybe they're in lies the answer in so much as the marketplace, just as Microsoft has had to up its game. You know, it's part of the biggest way to mitigate the risk is through education, and as people become this sort of free use of information becomes more mature, then therein people's attitudes might change. And when that happens, actually those who supply the actual services are going to have to react and deliver services that maybe people will get fed up with um, bleeding edge technology being sort of easy to compromise and maybe that will bring about a change. But again, I mean, education. I was going to say maybe people will want a Volvo, basically. Is, um, the, the, seriously, you know, in, in security terms, that they will look to certain suppliers and certain environments because they've got a security edge. And, um, but I think we, we're, we're a way off that, but I think that would be a great place if we could get to that. I think looking at, often I've heard people compare our, our trade to where health and safety was X years ago. But on a parallel of innovation, I'm sure the guy that invented the ladder wasn't thinking of security and safety when he invented it. <laughs> he was trying to solve the problem. And essentially, that's what like we're in the, we're still in this business of being techies that see the techie wonderfulness and they go, ooh, about it first. And we can't expect users to go, I'm not going to buy that ladder because it's dangerous. They're going to do a risk management decision, which we all do in our ordinary lives. And the same applies to whether we give our data to somebody or not, government and police aside. But that, that's what it's going to come down to. And I think how we evolve differently compared to the health and safety world is critical to us as a, as a future profession. Because I'm sure we all hear and often chastise health and safety says we can't do this, health and safety says that. I think the IA profession has an opportunity to reflect back on health and safety and how they use fear to bring in the necessity of risk management and, and forms and all of this stuff. So actually, Consumerisation of data is inevitable, whether it be videos or personal data. People are going to do whatever they want to do to get the benefits that they desire. Therefore, how can we evolve at that pace to support them in doing that safely? But then shouldn't we support their risk appetite? Yeah. Because if, if I want to overtake, you know, that's my decision. Yes. If I want to sort of leave it for a millimetre I pull in. Well, actually, no, because I'm probably going to kill someone. So it's probably not a good idea. But I think with the health and safety, you know, that sometimes that's gone mad. And sometimes I, I, I'm, I'm a great believer in risk uh, or in risk management and people making decisions as long as they know what the risks are. Precisely. And I think that if people become more sophisticated as they will in understanding their personal devices and all of the other things. Um, I mean, there'll be a whole so, load of other things that will come along. But if they build up that risk understanding, then it's down to them to make their decisions about where they put their data and or not. But I, I think we are forgetting the fundamental lesson here is, is people are, seem to be forgetting the risks. Because having smartphones, that's not really new technology. It's just a reboxing of old technology. It's just a laptop that's made smaller and far more portable. And people understand how to protect laptops and um, not to leave, the, leave, leave them in public, like most people do, not to leave them on buses, etc. <laughs> but we seem to forget those lessons with smartphones and look at it as something completely different. So people need to just remember the fundamentals and the basics, and that's the lessons. I think there is a good potential lesson. I mean, if we think about the awareness, for example, and the promotion of controls such as anti-malware on desktop and laptop PCs, now it's pretty pretty much ingrained. You can't go and buy one very often without there being some lob towards the need to protect it. But I don't think that's the same for smartphones at the moment, even though there is a tangible growth now in the level of malware that's actually targeting well, at least certain subsets of those platforms. And yet, there, and if you have a look at the, the survey uh, result sheet that was put in the delegate pack for the event, you'll see some findings that we had here from the university, asking people about their use of antivirus software on laptops and normal PCs versus on smartphones, and there's a very, very significant difference. Obviously, the volume and the extent of the threat is different, but the underlying awareness of the problem is, is really quite disparate. Um, and that probably links into a a further question that I can ask the panel, because we've had the issue of awareness coming up quite a number of times. 
So to what extent do you believe, or otherwise, we can now assume a baseline level of security or threat awareness among staff within modern organisations? How much do we still have to push the basic message? I think you have to put the basic message all the time and constantly. I mean, it just gets forgotten. People have so much to do these days and um, it's just one part of the multitude of um, aspects of their life and what they need to do. Um, we try and do it every time we put out a message about anything um, computer related now. We'll put a, a message on how they can do <coughs> security-wise and protect themselves at home and at work. Mm -hmm. And um, you can never tell someone too many times. And I don't think you can ever start too early. Um, E-Skills are doing some work with um, schools where something like Make Me Happy campaign and various other things you know, that they're doing. And I think it's, it's almost got to be something that you learn as soon as you can sort of start thinking for yourself about things, about, you know, not, not in huge amounts of debt, but it just has to layer up and up and up so that it becomes part of your core reasoning. And um, the messages change as our, I don't know, sophistication changes, and that will depend really where we are in our lives and, um, and, and our experiences before us. And, and also our leadership needs to lead by example. Yeah. It was a great case. Oh, yes. um, Francis Lord, who's responsible for the Cabinet Office and IT security in the country, about a month ago decided he, that the Parliament network was far too um, secure, for, well, far too locked down for his purposes, so installed his own Wi, wi Fi hotspot and laptop, as an iPad, and started using that for sensitive um, information. We're going to have our leaders lead by example. There's no use them telling us one thing and then doing another. And that goes through all walks of society. <coughs> now, I actually think that's a fairly good point at which to wrap up the discussion. Um, because we're running to the end of time, I think we've had a very good discussion from the panel and from you as the audience. Thank you for participating. And thank you very much indeed to the panel members. Thank you.